This has been an amazing week. I've been given a tremendous privilege. Um, you know that I'm very, very critical of militant Islam and that uh, domestic Islamic pressure groups, CARE, the Council for American Islamic Relations, and the American Arab Anti-Discrimination League have actually thrown demonstrations against me and have tried to end my publishing career. So you would think, Bloom, he's a racist. And that's what they say. Apparently not. Apparently there's a deep truth to what I'm saying. Because my material on Islam comes out of the Quran, the Hadith, Ibn Ishaq, and Al-Tabari. Ibn Ishaq and Al-Tabari are the first biographers in the Muslim world of Muhammad himself. These are Islamic sources. So where do I get my respect? Where do they really enjoy having me on camera? Iranian television. Saudi television. And I've been getting a lot of calls from Iranian television and Saudi television over the last 10 days. Um, I've done so far a total of six interviews and I'm scheduled for at least another one tomorrow. And one of the great things about going up to Iranian and Saudi TV is that I'm talking to people from Iraq, from Egypt, and from Iran. Those are the camera people, the people, the staff people, and the interviewers. And they let me cut loose behind the camera on the total world picture. Well, the total world picture right now is centered on Syria and on the question of whether Barack Obama should be ordering some sort of military strike against the Syrians in retaliation for their use of chemical weapons killing 1,400 people. Well, there are big questions here. One question is, did the Syrian regime kill 1,400 people with chemical weapons? Who did it? I was asked today if there's a possibility that this was, this was a false flag operation and that the Free Syrian Army, the rabble of miscellaneous forces that we tend to support, could have pulled this off. Yes, it could have pulled it off. The, our government has issued a three-page statement summarizing its intelligence conclusions that prove that Assad did this. It doesn't prove that Assad did this. It's weak, it's flimsy, it's reminiscent of the problem with the weapons of mass destruction. The bottom line here is that by militarily attacking Syria and weakening um, Assad, we can do more harm than good. We can do ourselves more harm than good. So sometimes it's useful to step back from a situation, abandon all of the traditional ways of analyzing it, and look for a framework, a perspective that makes more sense, that seems to plug into a deeper truth. And in preaching to the staff at Iranian and Saudi TV, something they let me do, they let me think through the problem. And here's the conclusion. Here's what I would do if I were in Obama's position. The enemy is not Bashir Assad. Bashir Assad is a source of stability. We've learned an enormous lesson from the Arab Spring. Instability kills. It kills people in the Middle East and it threatens us. It brings people to the surface who hate our guts. We do not want to increase the instability. What's worse, if we weaken Assad's control over the chemical weapons, who do you think will end up taking them from wherever they happen to be? If we attack the chemical weapons facilities, we will let those chemical weapons loose. We will be chemically attacking the Syrians because we will let those weapons loose in clouds into the air and they will settle anywhere, everywhere. And the weapons themselves, the canisters, the rockets, the warheads, those will end up in the hands of the rabble that calls itself the Free Syrian Army. And that rabble is as trustworthy as the rabble that is now running Libya. A bunch of militias in the street, each fighting for control over a block, two blocks, four blocks, a neighborhood, and not caring who they kill and who they intimidate in order to keep their space. It's gangster land in Libya right now. Is that what we really want in Syria? Is that what we really want on our track record, our moral track record, to have reduced 
the people of Syria from one form of misery to a form of misery far more profound. Here's the real deal. Here's the bottom line. We do have enemies in Syria. There is a nascent, an embryonic, a baby, Al-Qaeda state being formed. It's being formed by two groups, Al-Nusra, who you've probably heard of, the Al-Qaeda forces, the major Al-Qaeda force in Syria, and another one that you've heard me talk about. It calls itself the Emirate of Iraq and Al-Sham, which means, it can be variously translated, but it basically means uh, the Emirate, that means the military dictatorship. The Emir is a general, a state run by a general. The military dictatorship of Iraq, Syria, and the Levant is in essence what its name means. What does that tell you about its ambitions? They're large. They're to control not just Syria, but to control a much vaster territory. And they are our enemies. They hate us. They loathe us. They are willing to kill anybody to achieve their aims. And their aims are world domination. I mean, that sounds silly. It may sound conspiratorial. It's not conspiracy thinking. Those are their aims. They're not just our enemies. They're, and they're not just Assad's enemies. They're Saudi Arabia's enemies. They're Iran's enemies. They're even Russia's enemies. Remember, Russia has a vast territory that in the 1500s, 1600s, and 1700s, it took from another huge empire, the Persian Empire. In other words, these are Muslim territories. A huge part of the Russian zone of influence is Muslim. And it has been suffering from Muslim terrorism, from Muslim extremism, from Al-Qaeda-style extremism. For years, that's what the war in Chechnya was all about. For decades, the Russians have been begging us to recognize that this is a war of terrorism against Russia and to side with them since we have our own problems with terrorism. And guess what? We've been assholes. We've refused. That's why when we were given information from the Russians on two brothers in Boston who might be leaning toward the terrorist side of things, we ignored it because we've been ignoring the Russians' problem with terrorism and Al-Qaeda or Al-Qaeda-style forces for a long time. It's time to stop it. We need something that will unite us with the Russians. We need something that will unite the Saudis and the Iranians. Remember, this terrible war that's killed 110,000 people in Syria is a proxy war. It's a proxy war between Saudi Arabia and Iran. And what unites us all? What common interest do we all have? We have a common enemy. It's the growing state of Al-Qaeda. And it's not just the growing state of Al-Qaeda in Syria and Iraq. It's the growing state of Al-Qaeda in Africa, in Mali, and in the Western Sahara. And any military forces we use in the Middle East right now should not be aimed at weakening Assad, who represents stability. It should be aimed against al-Nusra. It should be aimed against the emirate of Iraq and al-Sham. It should be aimed against a baby embryonic al-Qaeda state that will love it. Will love it if we destabilize Syria because they will be the real winners. So it's time for Barack Obama to some, do something that only a leader can do and very few leaders have the courage to do. Remember, consistency is the hobgoblin of little minds. It is time for Barack Obama to say, I made a mistake in drawing that red line. We've learned lessons from the last two years of the Arab Spring. Our real enemy is not where we think it is. It's in al-Nusra. It's in the Emirate. It's in Al-Qaeda. And it's time for us to unite. He could use the G20 meeting he's in right now in St. Petersburg to try to unite all of those forces that are squabbling with each other right now, Russia, Saudi Arabia, Iran, and go against the real enemy. And who do I have to thank for allowing me to think this through? 
Iranian television, Saudi television, who listened and let me talk. This is Howard the Humongous talking to you from the future that it's your job to make.